Oh, okay, so yes, um, as Pastor Q said um, last week when he spoke, I just realized that the last time I spoke was when I returned from the mission trip to Thailand. That was like the first week of April or something like that. It's been a super long time. I didn't really real realize that. Um, <clears throat> and so today... Okay. Um, as you know, um, I continue to do a series of, uh, about people from the Bible, various uh, persons from the Bible, and I will continue that. But um, I want to say that it's been really an interesting week. Um, unless you've been, you know, completely a hermit and uh, closed off from the world, uh, it's been a very difficult week because of lots of news that we've been hearing. Um, as you know, very uh, two high-profile, famous people took their lives, took their own lives um, in this past week. In the fashion world, the fashion world was rocked to find out that Kate Spade hung herself in her uh, Park Avenue, New York apartment on Tuesday, June 5th. She left a note for her daughter. Then three days later, on Friday, June 8th, we were shocked once again when news broke that Anthony Bourdain, the uh, celebrity chef and star of CNN's TV show uh, Parts Unknown, had also hung himself in a hotel room in France. And it's been reported that they both suffered from depression. And I just wanted to say a word about depression, you know, and about uh, suicide. Suicide is nothing new. People have been dying from it for as long as anyone can remember, right, from the beginning of time. But because of these two high-profile figures that did it in such a way, it's just all over the news and media and the issue of um, mental health and, and suicidal thoughts and, and all these kind of things have just been really completely uh, brought to the forefront. And I think that it is a stigma, and particularly in Asian cultures, and also in the Christian world. Um, and because we, most of us are Asian Christians, it's a double whammy for most of us sitting in this room. It's something we don't like to talk about. It's something that we kind of brush underneath. And, and I want to say that I was a, a very, very... Um, at fault with this as well, because, you know, we say that we have the joy of the Lord. You know, how can I be depressed or anxious? You know, be anxious for nothing, but, but prayer and supplication make your request known to God. So if I'm anxious, that means like, oh, you must not be praying, taking your request to God. If I'm depressed and sad all the time, then what's wrong with you? You have the Holy Spirit living in you. You should have the joy of the Lord, right? There's these comebacks, these quick um, things you can quote from the Bible and from theology that gives us every reason not to feel depressed, not to feel anxious, and not to have mental uh, illness. But, you know, as I have two preteen daughters, and as you know, as hormones and girl drama and just all that kind of stuff that we went through when we were younger, when hormones were just uncontrollable and, and um, things, social pressure, peer pressure, and those things kind of happened, it's very real to me, and it was because of, of these things that happened in the news, actually, that one of my daughters, for the first time ever, asked me about it and said, Mommy, are, are people born depressed? What, why are they depressed? Why would they take their lives? And, you know, began this conversation. Um, and, and I'm not shy about letting you guys know that I was on antidepressants uh, medication for a while because I had severe um, postpartum uh, depression after giving birth to my twins. Uh, in Seattle, where it rains every day, and it's really depressing anyway, but uh, it was in Seattle, and I gave birth to them, and it was just, you know, I rebuked it. I have the joy of the Lord. What are you talking about? I'm a pastor, you know? And so when my doctors were saying, yes, you are depressed, you need to take medicine, I was like, oh, I rebuke that, you know? And so I'm guilty of it too, and I just want to um, mention that you know, depression and uh, mental illness, as well as feelings of anxiety, anxiety attacks, all these things are so real. And I think we ignore it too much um, in the church. And um, again, just these two are bringing it to the forefront, but the statistics are staggering. I looked up a lot of information preparing for today's message, and a lot of the statistics saying, you realize we only hear about the suicides that were successful. You don't hear about the thousands, if, you know, upon thousands, attempts 
at suicide and they fail. That's not blasted in the news. We only hear about, you know, think about the percentage of, of those who actually are successful, but the percentage of people who are not successful or who try a second time or a third time. And just want you to think about that. And if you um, know, if you yourself are in that kind of um, place or know of other people, don't be afraid, especially in this Christian community. Do not be afraid to ask and reach out for help and, and, and to talk about it. We have a mother's group. We have a Bible study, Oasis, every Thursday morning. And we talk about that quite a lot because these are all moms who have recently given birth or, or have really young ones and they're stay-at-home moms. And we talk about that a lot. So again, um, this real issue of suffering, suffering to the point where, and I read this interesting quote, is it's not so much that they wanted to die. Most people who commit suicide, it's not so much that they want to die it's that they don't want to live. And you're like, huh? But think about that statement. It's not so much that they want to die, but they're in so much mental and emotional torment and anguish and, and that they just don't want to live any longer. Think about that. It's not so much that they're choosing death. Again, it's been a very strange week because of that. And this week, I received a text message from a very close friend who's an elementary school teacher. Um, she texted us to please pray because a fifth grader uh, in her school died recently, very suddenly. And we had actually been praying for this uh, student for two weeks when she first told us about this child. One day, he's in school. He's a fifth grade student. One day, he's in school, and he, cl he complained of horrible headaches. And so his parents were called, and his parents came, picked him up, took him home. And then later that night, um, his headaches got even worse. And so his parents just took him to the hospital, I think to Shady Grove. And then um, when he got examined in the um, emergency room and stuff, they prepped him and said he needed emergency um, brain surgery. So I'm not sure what, what was wrong with him and all that stuff, but I know that he was prepped and he was admitted and had to have immediate brain surgery. And so then we had been praying for two weeks for his recovery and just, just everything. And then I got the text a couple of days ago that he died. He didn't make it. And to please pray for his family and uh, the rest of the school. And this is really, really difficult. I cannot even imagine what his family and his school community is going through. Myself as a parent of fifth, uh, fifth sixth graders, of sixth graders. Um, and, you know, I can't even imagine that, especially because the fifth graders this week are having graduations. So imagine just that family, the community of, of the rest of the fifth graders who are going to be graduating. Now, the sudden loss and the death of a loved one is one of the most difficult tragedies that anyone can experience. I know many of us have experienced it, and for those of us who have not experienced the death of a loved one, um, I know that there are other tragedies that you may have suffered. We all experience suffering in our lives in one way or another, and being a Christian does not exempt us from experiencing it or going through it. Again, people quote stuff like the joy of the Lord and, you know, God, Jesus is my savior and now, you know, I'm free and, and uh, I'm saved. And, and some people just um, have the wrong idea or they're misinformed thinking that, you know, life is all good and, you know, once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior. But in fact, being a Christian may sometimes cause us more suffering you all know what I mean, right? It may cause us more suffering. This is not something that we want to hear. Of course not as Christians. But we know about Christians who have been persecuted, who have been um, killed, who have been tortured throughout history for their faith, for the simple fact that they profess a faith in Jesus Christ. And it still happens today. Every month we get a little notice that says church around the world, right? And focus on the family, the little insert that you have in your uh, worship bulletin. If you read the stuff that's going around in this world about the persecution of Christians, you know, we really have to open our eyes to that fact. And like I said, it still happens today. We don't have to look any further than Andrew Brunson. He's suffering for the gospel. His only crime being that he's a pastor, you know, serving in this country that's politically, uh, you know. And so he is in prison for the gospel. He is suffering. His family, his wife and children are suffering. Didn't Jesus, God's own son, who is God himself, didn't he experience much suffering? 
any of us who read the Bible and we claim to follow him, we know that he suffered much, right? So then why are we so surprised when we go through suffering, when suffering and calamity falls upon us? Why are we so surprised? And why do we then so often blame God or reject God or turn our backs on God or question him, question his goodness, right? When that child, fifth grader, died, right, and my friends were talking, what do you say to his parents who are non-believers and say, why? What do you say? What kind of God would take my son like this, you know? He woke up, went to school, he had a headache, you know? And then that evening, he was having brain surgery. What, what, my friend was asking me genuinely. She was like, what do I say to the parent? Come on, Mimi, you're a pastor. What do you say to the parent? And I said, any discussion about things like this sufferings that people experience and, and, and um, these kind of tragedies and things like that. Any discussion must begin with the presupposition that God is good. Just like Pastor Q was speaking about earlier today, it must begin with the presupposition that God is good. And if we can't agree on that, then that conversation is not going to go and make any sense. If you're not a believer and you don't begin with the very basic, the firm foundation, presupposition that God is good, come hell or high water, you know, that's a phrase, come whatever, you begin with that fact, you know, that God is good. But if people who are not believers cannot agree on that, and that's not the starting point of your conversation, it's, you know, right? And that's what I said to my friend, and, you know, of course, my friend's a Christian, and she's like, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, that's, that's it. So why are we surprised when we, too, go through suffering? And the thing about suffering is that it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't play favorites, right? Disaster, accidents, illness, cancer, financial troubles, they all affect people everywhere. No matter who you are, no matter how wealthy and famous you are, like these guys, no matter if you are, I don't know, a homeless person on the street, no matter your station in life, your gender or, or whatever, it affects people everywhere. Many of us have a similar simple understanding of how God works because we're taught as children the simple fact that God punishes evil and God rewards good, right? It's kind of like the, the good versus evil. We kind of have it in our minds and we're taught this when we're young. God punishes the evildoers and God rewards the good. There are many stories from the Bible that plays this out. Think about it. Sodom and Gomorrah. What happens in Sodom and Gomorrah? The people were evil, so God destroys it but he saves Lot and his family because Lot was found righteous, right? So you see all oh, these evildoers and, you know, fornicators, Adam and Gomorrah, and so it gets destroyed because they're evil. Lot found righteous, he's good, he's saved. Similar is the story of Noah. What happens in Noah? God was grieved that he had created man. He was grieved that he had created humans um, because of their wickedness and how they you know, began to act and live on earth. So he sends a flood to wipe everyone out except for Noah and his family. Because once again, Genesis chapter 6, 9 says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah's good. He was saved, safe in the ark, everyone else evil, destroyed. So it's these stories and others like it in the Bible that teach us at a very early age about the consequences for good and evil. But if that were true, if this was true, how come when we look around, it seems more often that it is the righteous that suffer and the wicked that prosper? Right? I am sure at one time or another, you have all asked yourselves this question. If all this is true, then why is it that the righteous seem to suffer and the wicked seem to get away with it? The wicked seem to prosper with this, right? We've all seen and experienced it. You play by the rules, you do your best, you live honestly, um, pay your taxes, you don't want to cheat anyone, but it seems everyone else, especially those who are cheaters, especially those who are dishonest and, you know, bending the rules and things like that, they're the ones getting ahead in life, right? That's what it seems to us in this life, that they're somehow getting ahead and, and we're being left behind or we're missing out and we're just suckers, you know, because we're such a nice guy, or we're, we're rule followers, but no one else is, and so actually, you know, we're, we're suckers. But yes, the key is in this life, in this life, that's what it seems like. And in this life, 
who is controlling things in this life and on this earth. But remember, this is not our home. It is only temporary. It is only temporary. There's so many verses in the Bible about how our reward is in heaven and, and all this and how the sufferings are temporary for this time here on earth. But judgment day will come and is coming. Judgment day is coming for those people, those evildoers, the cheaters, the scammers, all those people, but also for us, lest we think that we're somehow exempt, but also for us. So in the meantime, we suffer. In the meantime, we are suffering. So the person I want to look at today from the Bible is Job. You guys all knew this was coming, right? The person today that I will focus on is Job. And to Christians, his name is synonymous with suffering, right? Anytime you think about Job, he's the one that you read. He's the one that you go to when you're experiencing great suffering and, and tragedy and hardship. And I didn't give um, a specific verse because we're going to jump around a lot in the book of Job. So if you guys can all open your Bibles to the book of Job. Now, Job is believed to be the oldest book in the Bible. It is the first book written, even before Genesis. People just think that it's chronological Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, but Job is even older. It is the oldest book um, of the Bible, the books in the Bible that was written. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with this book. Um, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you uh, know his name. Everybody who doesn't know about Job and who may not be a Christian, call it, they call it Job, you know, but it's Job. We pronounce it that way. And we're familiar with this because the book of Job and Job himself explores the question of suffering. It, more specifically, the question of why do the righteous suffer? And also, where is God in the midst of my suffering? It explores these two questions. Now, I know this is difficult to see. It's really difficult to see, right? You, you don't need to read all the things, but I just kind of wanted you to see the overall structure. I think it's helpful for us to see uh, because there are 42 chapters. It's quite a, um, a thick book, actually. It's difficult to see, but I, want, um, I think it'll be helpful to see the structure here. Chapters 1 and 2 is the prologue. Oh, he didn't, you didn't leave it in there, huh? Chapters 1 and 2 is the prologue that you'll see. And then all the verses in between, the prologue shows that this, this whole thing originated in the heavenlies. It originated in the heavenly court, and it's a trial that's happening, right? And, and it's like the behind-the-scenes um, kind of thing. You'll see the prologue. And then all of the other, um, chapter 3 all the way to uh, chapter 42, verse 6, is poetry. If you look at it in your actual Bible, it's all all, you know, written out as, as a poetic and poetry. It's the dialogue. It's the back and forth, back and forth. It's the back and forth between Job and his three friends. And it's broken down into three cycles. It's broken into three dialogues that they are having. You know, he speaks and then he speaks. He responds and then he speaks. So it's three cycles of, of this going on. And then the last part, the epilogue, is chapter 42, and is verses 7 through 17. The last few verses of the book of Job is an epilogue, and it shows the verdict. It shows the conclusion to the trial that was set before us in the prologue. So let's look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is what it says. There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. So this is Job. And in the story, we know that Satan makes a deal with God. Satan believes that the only reason that Job honors and worships God is because God has blessed him so richly. That there's a reason to, as, as to why Job honors and worships God so much. It's because he's the richest person in that entire area. He has been blessed with so much, right? So, and um, that Job only fears and loves God for what God has done for him. He's got children, he's got material wealth, all this thing. And if ever all his belongings, all his blessings were taken away, or in other words, if Job had to experience true suffering, then he would curse God to his face. If all these things were taken away, Satan truly believes that Job would curse God to God's face. So let's look at God's response. 
God's response. All right. And this is God speaking to Satan. All right, Satan, you may test him, the Lord said. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Then we know what happens. Look at this. We know what happens. The afflictions to Job, all this happens. His oxen, his donkeys, his camels, they all get stolen. His servants are all killed. They're all murdered. Fire falls from heaven, and his sheep and the rest of his other servants are all burned up. There's a freak windstorm. His sons and daughters all happen to be in one place, in one room, in one house. Freak windstorm comes upon the house, and the house collapses on top of all his children, and they all die instantly. Man, how much bad can happen to one person, right? So what do you think his reaction is to all this horrific news? Because these messengers come running to Job to tell him, oh my goodness, runs and tells him this. And then another one runs and says, oh, this happened. And another one runs and says, this happened, right? So what is Job's reaction to all of this? This is his reaction, verses 20 through 22. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. This is where the lyrics from Matt Redman's famous song, Blessed Be Your Name, you know that song, Blessed Be Your Name? This is where um, it comes from. And a lot of funeral services, worship services, they will quote this, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. It's a very well-known and famous quote, but it all comes from Job here. So this is his response. He worships. Wow, this would not have been my response. This, this would not have been my reaction. So Job passes this first test. But the, Satan goes one step further. Satan takes it one step further, telling God that Job will certainly curse God if he had to suffer personal, physical pain and discomfort and affliction. This is things that just happened, like his property, his children, and, you know. But if Job himself had to endure and suffer and experience a personal and, and physical ailment and pain, things would be different. He would definitely curse God. If his health was compromised, his wealth was taken, but now what about his health? So let's look at God's response to the second challenge that Satan puts to him. In chapter 2, verse 6, this is him speaking God. All right, do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. What's interesting here, too, if you will note, is that, you know, Satan can only do so much. You know, that God still, Satan has limited powers. He is not omniscient, omnipotent as God is. Even in the midst of trials and testings and things, God is still in control. He puts limits and boundaries. This is good news for us, folks, when you think about this. So even here, he says, spare his life. So what does Satan do? These are the afflictions to Job's bodies. All through the verses, there were painful sores that covered his entire body. It doesn't say it like um, boils. It says there were like boils all over his body. I'm willing to bet that it was probably adult chicken pox. Adult chicken pox is horrible. I think I told you once before that Hoon had it when he was a grown man. He was like in his 30s and he had it and it was bad. We had to take him to the emergency room twice in the middle of the night because it was it was bad. I think the older you are, you can really die from chicken pots. Painful sores. There were broken, festering, black, peeling skin with worms and scabs. His body was gaunt because he was, certainly he wasn't eating. He wasn't in the mood to be eating. Uh, he was red-faced from weeping, dark shadows around his eyes. He's got the ugly cry face going on. There's unending pain happening to him, and he has a fever. If you look up all these various verses. These are his physical afflictions and his sufferings. Satan doesn't give up easily, friends. Satan doesn't give up easily. The more we hold on to our faith, the more he attacks. He will try to take it further. So let's look at verses 7 through 10. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores or boils from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes because probably it was itchy. It was itching, so he's like <laughs> scratching himself with broken pottery. 
Um, his wife say, um, says to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. This is the first that we hear of Job's wife. We knew he had children, but this is the first that we see and hear of Job's wife. Satan had destroyed all his wealth, killed his children, you know, and even now touched his physical body, harmed his health. And now we see one last thing that can completely destroy a man and discourage a man. And what is that? Losing his wife's support. You married men out there. When everything is going wrong in your life, work is, you know, horrible, your children aren't listening to you, and, you know, just stress and everything like that. But if you've got a wife at home who's still supporting you in your corner, saying, things are good, honey, still I believe in you, things can get better, you know, I'm in your corner. And if you've got that wife, then you're good, you know, husbands, fathers, men. But here, you see, the wife says to him and speaks to him with such disdain and says, you idiot, are you still, how, what good is your integrity? What good is your righteousness? Curse God and die. What wife says that to a husband? But think about this for a moment, the dynamics here of husband and wife as well. But despite, oh, I wanted to show you. Ooh, this is a visual. Ooh, so this is a visual of this to just kind of bring it home. I found this. Um, the Illustrated Bible. This is his wife. This is poor Job covered in boils and, and just kind of get that visual of, ugh, you know, curse God and die. But despite all his suffering, Job never sinned in what he said. He never blames God or curses God. So he passes the second test. But, big but here, but he does curse the day that he was born. He does curse the day that he was born. He was so miserable and his suffering was so intense and so great that he curses the day that he was born. Look at this. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, as well as 11 and 16, I will show you. At last, Job spoke, and he cursed the day of his birth. He said, let the day of my birth be erased, and the night I was conceived. Let that day be turned to darkness. Let it be lost even to God on high, and let no light shine on it, on that day. And he says, why wasn't I born dead? Why didn't I die as I came from the womb? Why wasn't I buried like a stillborn child, like a baby who never lives to see the light? Think about his distress. He is wishing that he, was, he had never been born in the first place. Any of you ever feel that way? I'm sure everybody at one time or another has felt this way. You wish that, you know, life is just so hard. You wish that you had never been born. Things are so difficult. You come to that place of despair where you think that it's better to be dead than alive. And still, nevertheless, he, pers he persevered in his faith. Job still perseveres in his faith. Through all this, Job never, never knew why. In the prologue, there's a conversation going on between Satan and God. Job is not privy to that. He doesn't know. He doesn't understand why and what and the background reason behind all this, right? So through it all, he never knows why. Even in the end, he's not told why. Why? What was all this for? What was it all about? He doesn't know. His three friends try to give him advice. I have a lot more I want to say on his three friends. It'll take another whole sermon. Um, so I'm not going to focus on all the things that his friends said. But these three friends, they give him advice, and they try to come up with an explanation for why this is happening to their friend Job here. But they were wrong. The explanations, the advice, the things that they come up with are pure conjecture. They are theories. They are their opinions of why this is happening to Job. And they're just speaking their mind, their opinions and theories, and they are wrong. If Job had known the reasons for his afflictions, if Job had known the reasons for his sufferings, there would have been no faith involved on his part. There would have been no faith involved on his part. Think about this. If he knew that there was a deal going on and he was being tested in this way and he knew what was coming and why, you can endure that. The greatest difficulty in life is the not knowing, is the not knowing. And so he doesn't know, he doesn't understand, and yet he endures. And so faith is so important here. If he knew all this stuff, there would be no place 
for faith to play a part. Job wasn't meant to know why. Job wasn't meant to know why. And I think that's very, very hard for us to accept. We're so inquisitive as humans. We like to know everything. I like to know everything. I like to know as much as I can, right? And I know we're like that. We want to know. We want to know why, Lord, why? Why me? When we go through things, we want to know. We want to ask the question, why did this happen to me? We ask the question, why is this happening now? What did I do wrong? You know, and we ask and cry out to God and want to know. And good friends come and try to give us reasons. Uh, Pastors will come. Uh, Spiritual mentors and leaders will come around you. And they will you know, try to comfort you and and speak some truth. And I'm not saying that the things that these people are saying to you are all false, but they will come and they are just, you know, speaking from what they know. And with good motives, they want to comfort you and, and try to say the right things, right? God does finally speak in Job chapter um, 38 through 41. God does speak. He answers Job, but he doesn't address the question of suffering at all. He speaks He answers Job. He responds to Job, but he doesn't address the issue of suffering and the question of why. Instead, it's all about the reality of who he is. If you read, um, and again, we just don't have the time to read the entire chapter, but I encourage you, go back and read chapters um, 38 through 41. It's all about the reality of who God is, about his sovereignty, about the fact that he is Lord of the universe, about the fact that he is creator of all. And so when you know Job is crying out saying, oh, I wish I was never born, whoa, it's me and all this stuff. God says, do you know when the sun rises and the sun sets? Do you, you know, when this and that? And all this talk about creation and and things that happen in nature and, and things of the universe. He just, God keeps speaking and responds to Job talking about his sovereignty, that he is Lord, he is the creator, he causes the sun to rise and set, and, and all this is in his hands. And the Surprising thing, amazing thing here is with God's response, with this response, Job is satisfied. Again, I'm going to admit I wouldn't have taken that as an answer. I'm going to admit that I most likely would not have been satisfied. I would have pushed for more. Like, that's it? You know, tell me why. And I would keep pushing, right? You know how some people like that are. But look, um, Oh, I didn't show you these verses. Uh, with this, Job is satisfied. He says, this is Job's response to him. Then Job replies to the Lord after the Lord says all this. I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? God asked that. It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me, is what he says. And then five, six, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, God, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. So here Job is saying, I'd only heard about you, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, everything I questioned, you know, all these things, and I repent of it. I repent from it. Everything else pales in comparison to a personal encounter with God. Let me repeat that. Everything else pales in comparison with a personal encounter with God. So all these questions, all this that he's experiencing, the loss of his family, the loss of his wealth, the physical afflictions, everything that he's going through, God comes and speaks to him. They have a dialogue. He encounters the almighty, sovereign amazing God, and all of it falls away, and he says, I was talking about things I knew nothing about, you know? My small human little brain, I'm, you know, these things are too wonderful for me. The things of God are too wonderful for me. The reasons for why you do and why, you don't need to answer to me, Job is saying. You don't need to, to tell me everything. You know, you're not required to tell me everything. And so he says, I take back everything I said, and I repent. I repent. One Bible scholar calls Job's words in chapter 19, um, verses 23 to 27, which I will show you. One Bible scholar says in chapter 19, verses 23 to 27, he says, quote, 
This is the most enlightened prehistoric confession of faith. You know, we do the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. That's our confession of faith. Look at this. The scholar says that chapter 19, remember, this was written before Genesis. You know, this is written before Jesus. And he says, this is the most enlightened prehistoric confession of faith. Oh, that my words could be recorded. Oh, that they could be inscribed on a monument, carved with an iron chisel and filled with lead, engraved forever in the rock. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. My Redeemer lives. This is Job saying this thousands, thousands of years ago. This confession of faith. This is amazing when you think about it. And yet, my Redeemer lives. And though my body wastes away, you know, dead corpse and, and everything, I shall see. And he looks forward to this day. Even in the midst of his pain and suffering, Job holds on to faith. And he looks forward to a better day. He looks forward, my Redeemer lives. I will see him for myself. I will see him with my own eyes. And I am overwhelmed at the thought of it. Even in the midst of our, our, I'm trying to say trials and struggles at the same time. I almost said trials. Struggles and trials, even in the midst of that. Who can say this? Who can confess this kind of faith and say, yet I look for that day. My Redeemer lives and I will see him with my own eyes. And I am overwhelmed at the thought. By the way, in the epilogue, um, if you read it, when the trial is over, we see that God actually restores all of Job's wealth. In fact, double blessings. He restores to him double of what he had before. And he has seven sons and three daughters again, his 10 children. He has more kids. All this happens, a double blessing. You know, I don't want to make light of anyone's suffering. I don't want you to think, oh, okay, so as I follow Job, I guess whatever suffering I'm experiencing right now, I can look forward to double blessings, right? So, okay, you know, I can endure this because there's going to come double blessings. Now, it did work in my case because, as you know, 10 long years of infertility and just praying and praying and just seeing doctors, fertility clinics and everything, right? Right? 10 years of not having children, and then twins, double blessings. Many people have spoken words over me that I, I was not to give up, that I was meant to be a, a parent, and that the double blessings. When I was at Bethel, um, and for a prophetic word at the Bethel Advanced Conference, and, um, you know, they don't know me, but every person gets to go and sit with the um, those who are speaking words over your prophetic. And even then, there was a three of them that sat. And a couple years ago, when I went out to California at the church, they were speaking, and they said, um, I see that something is being birthed in you. They said, there's something you as a woman, as, as a, um, a leader in ministry, as a pastor, something is birthed in you. Kind of like twins. She just kind of said, kind of like twins. And I had my eyes closed. I was receiving the word. And I was like, and I opened my eyes. I'm like, oh, there's no way she would know that I had twins. But it was just so for me, uh, 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 just a reality check for me, that physically giving birth to these twins, that there was something as well that she was telling me. There are two things that I was to do in, in um and ministry and stuff. But yeah, so for me, again, double blessings. And for Job here at the end in the epilogue, you will read that he was restored. If he had 5,000 oxen, it became 10,000 oxen. You know, 7,000 sheep, it was 14,000. So things were doubled for him. But that doesn't always happen for every one of us. And we are Christians, we believe in the same God, and we endure suffering all the same. But it's not that we, it will happen to everyone. But again, we go back to this. His ways and thoughts are so wonderful that our minds cannot conceive. Even if God tried to explain the reasoning behind why, the rhyme and reason of why he does what he does, 
I have to think that my little pea brain mind is not going to be able to absolutely conceive and wrap my head around, eh, that doesn't make sense to me, you know? Because remember, he makes the foolish, you know, the wise, the wise things of the, it's for the foolish. So it, our economy and the rich are poor, the poor are rich, and, and the first shall be last, uh, you know, last shall be first, all these things flipped and stuff, we don't understand that. That makes no sense to us, right? It, it, it doesn't make sense. But I want to conclude with this last statement. The whole book of Job is a grand illustration of Romans 8.28. We sang this. You know, I didn't even coordinate with the praise team. I didn't coordinate it. But you know, you know, God is just coordinating everything. Romans 8.28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Think about the book of Job from beginning to end. This entire story, the book of Job, Job's life, you can see it as a grand illustration of this verse, that God causes everything to work together for the good, not for the bad, not for the evil, but for the good, but not for everyone. It's those who love God, for those who love God. A lot of times we just stop right there and say, God causes everything to work together for good, and we stop right there. No, for those who love God, and are called. Those of us who love God and are called, and according to not my purposes, not my will be done, not my understanding of things, not how I want to see things happen, but to his purpose, to his purpose for us. That's amazing. And we as Christians, if we take this seriously, look at the story in the book of Job, and we see this verse. Now, I don't know what tragedy or great suffering that you may have experienced in the past. And I'm sure that you asked God why. Why did this happen? Why at this time? And why me? Why to my family? I'm sure you asked. You might have received an answer. Some of us are are blessed and we receive an answer. And after such suffering or trial, we are given some insight into why it had to happen, right? Again, Job never knew. He was not privy to what was happening in the heavenly court between Satan and God. So whatever suffering that you may have experienced or trial, if you are going through something right now, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's an illness of a child, whether it's financial you know, uh, ruin, whether it's whatever it may be, something at work, you know, whatever you may be experiencing, we may not be privy to what's happening and what's the mind of God and why we're going through this and why this is, we're experiencing this. So you may be going through something, some form of suffering right now. If so, I want you to be encouraged by looking at Job. He went through something far worse than I can imagine. Losing your children and being afflicted physically and losing your fortune. I can understand one out of those three, but all three happening, bam, in the same, you know, time frame. That's incredible. And yet, he did not curse God. He kept his faith. And I want you to be encouraged. May our faith be as firm as Job's faith. May we encounter God as Job did. And... Be satisfied, not be in want of and dissatisfied and angry and bitter, but be satisfied that we are in his will. God's got this. We don't understand it or know it, but God's got this. And be satisfied. Let's all stand. So as we sing this um praise song. This is always just a response time. We build in this time of just singing a last song for us to be able to respond to what we have just heard. If anything that was spoken touched you or brought up memories or brought up things, it's, it's this time while we're singing this song to wrestle with God. Ask God about it. If you need peace from Him, if you need questions answered. So we just pray that God is speaking to you even now about the struggles and trials that you have been through in the past and that you may be going through right now.